I am now about to explain more fully the ego. At the time of your conception during intercourse, as your father's consciousness rose via his spine ever higher to the top of his head and tension mounted toward its climax, your father's consciousness briefly touched divine consciousness, creating a flashpoint, a small explosion, which he experienced as orgasm, and thereafter an injection of divine consciousness was infused in his semen to give life to the mother's ovum. The moment of union with woman and the explosion of tension in a man at the time of orgasm reenacts the time of the Big Bang, when the unity of father-mother consciousness exploded into separate energies and the first electrical particles and random matter took form. Father consciousness provided the energy of activity and momentum, and mother consciousness provided the bonding to give form and substance to the electrical particles. These are primal impulses which give life and form to man and woman. I want you to understand that creation is not a creation of matter imbued with consciousness. Creation is the visible form of primal impulses drawn and bonded into individual shapes and entities, all expressing differing facets and combination of the primal impulses in a myriad of ways. Therefore, the primal impulses are the reality which your eyes, ears, smell, touch, tell you are solid matter, but are really consciousness impulses individualized in order to be experienced, intellectually understood, and appreciated emotionally. At the time of conception, when semen unites with ovum and a mating takes place, male consciousness chromosomes bond with female consciousness chromosomes. This is a physical union of your father's own consciousness of semen and your mother's own consciousness of ovum, powered by the divine. Thus do the male and female consciousness chromosomes carry the imprint of genetic DNA from both parents. The moment of physical union of semen and ovum is conducted on two levels of creativity. The injection of divine consciousness became your soul, embodied within the human consciousness union of semen and ovum. Physicality was created, powered by the father-mother life consciousness, which controlled the activity and bonding of conscious cells, producing the gradual growth and development of your physical body, which is really consciousness made visible on every level of your being, and nothing else. Your soul remained an inviolate flame, that's a metaphor, of father-mother life deeply enmeshed within the physical drives of activity, bonding, repulsion. These became your earthly individuality and personality, incorporated within the transcendent life impulses of divine father-mother consciousness. These consciousness impulses now took over the process of your physical consciousness creation and became the driving force behind your personality. Together, activity bonding labored to build conscious cell by conscious cell according to the consciousness specifications contained in the consciousness DNA molecules. Both personality and body are the product of these human impulses of activity, bonding, repulsion. While universal consciousness remains forever within equilibrium in the space, and therefore undetectable in that self-same space, in frequencies of vibration, the primal impulses of activity, bonding, Rejection work together in the visible dimension, appearing to your senses in the form of electromagnetism. Both universal consciousness and your soul remain undisturbed within the silence and stillness of equilibrium in space. The earthly consciousness creativity takes place within space and time and varying frequencies of vibration of materialized consciousness. Therefore, you take on living form and continue to exist within two dimensions. One dimension is unseen, the divine consciousness, and the other visible dimension is all that the living human being can sense or comprehend until spiritual development lifts its human consciousness frequencies of vibration to the spiritual plane 
and a glimmer of understanding enters its earthly consciousness. As this process of gradual enlightenment proceeds, the uplifted human consciousness then works consciously both within the unseen and the visible dimension. The higher the frequencies of vibration of individualized consciousness, the higher and more perfect are the forms created in the mind. The lower the frequencies of vibration, the more divorced from universal perfection of love are the forms created in the individualized mind wholly possessed by the ego drive. The ego takes over control of your developing fetus from the time of the union of the semen and ovum. The new little being became an I, immediately feeling satisfaction and dissatisfaction in the womb, depending on its sense of comfort or discomfort, and what was happening to the mother. When you were born, your instincts of survival, imprinted with the deep, primeval knowledge of created beingness buried in each living cell of your body, prompted you to breathe and become aware of an emotional emptiness and deprivation at your separation from the comfort of the confining womb, which was then felt as a physical emptiness and need for physical nourishment. Thus was your ego cry born. When you cried, you were given nourishment by your mother, which was deeply satisfying, both physically and emotionally. When your needs were fully met, you could slip back into a state of equilibrium within sleep. When you woke from your equilibrium, you felt a sense of insecurity, the equilibrium now divided into mental and emotional awareness. You remembered that mother and milk created a fulfillment of needy insecurity, and so again you cried. Your needs were fulfilled. So did your ego drive develop. Sometimes you cried and it was humanly decreed that it was not yet feeding time and you were left to cry for a while. This built up an awareness that needs were not always satisfied immediately, and you would have to adapt. You either chose anger and cried more vigorously, or lapsed into acceptance. Your choice of reaction depended on the characteristics of ego drive imprinted in your consciousness at birth. Neither forms of ego drive were to be condemned or judged. They were the natural result of the creative factor of ego which ensures individuality. As I have explained in my last letter, ego is the guardian of individuality. If you did not have this inbuilt impulse to cry for what you want to make you happy or reject what makes you sad, you would be in a limbo of nothingness. If you did not run when faced with danger or did not call for help when in danger, you might die. If you had not cried, demanded food, when you were born, you might have starved. If you had not welcomed mother's milk and nuzzled her warmly, you might never have developed a close caring bond with her. Without the ego drive, there would be no creation, no individuality, no fulfillment of need, no protection, no warmth of response, and no human love. Without the ego drive, there would be no self-defense, no self-protection, no survival. However, the ego drive, primarily the I of the individual, is imprinted only with the need for self-satisfaction and survival. In childhood, the I of the ego is governed by likes and dislikes, wants and rejection of what is not wanted, and by habits formed by a constant repetition of feelings, bad habits in the form of unacceptable ego responses to personal experiences, and the environment are formed and these are, in turn, imprinted in the unconscious or subconscious mind and remain hidden. However, they erupt into repeated behavior patterns when the memory of previous circumstances and modes of behavior unconsciously bring them to mind. Now the subconscious mind and the conscious mind begin to work together to develop the personality. Much of the behavior becomes conditioned behavior and very difficult to break. When the person is unconsciously programmed with strong self-centered ego habits of thought and behavior and finds it difficult to live with others in harmony, that person then goes to a psychologist for help in unraveling the complexities of the mental-emotional problems. 
Until my truth of existence is fully understood and the life-giving principles become the consistent guidelines of habits of thought and responses to life's experiences, the pain and suffering arising from the ignorant indulgence of ego drives will persist. The Church describes this human difficulty as being a temptation by Satan. It is no such thing. It is a natural process brought about by the uncontrolled reactions to life, powered by the ego drive, whose only purpose is to bring the individual happiness and contentment, fulfillment of need, or privacy, independence, security, peace, all directed at survival. It must be understood that there is nothing evil about the ego drive. It is a necessary tool of creation. It is the individual himself who brings about the imbalances in life by allowing the ego drive full control in his personality without thought or consideration for other people. This, too, is not to be judged or criticized since the person possessed by ego drive knows no other way to think or operate within the earthly dimension. The child knows nothing about self-control other than that taught by parents and school teachers. Therefore, the mistakes it makes in responding to life and its ups and downs can only be accepted in good spirit by parents and teachers since the child has no understanding of what is driving him. If he wants something, he wants something right away and wonders why he shouldn't have it. There is nothing more in his mind than this. He sees something he likes, he wants it. It is cruel to tell a child roughly, No, you can't have it. His entire system is insulted and assaulted. From earliest babyhood, the training process must be initiated by logic and reassurance, affirming his right to feel secure within his environment. His sense of security should be developed by explaining the right way to express his wishes. Love, not irritation or anger, must choose the words which tell the child why he cannot have what he wants. The child will hear the message when given in love. When delivered in anger, it arouses his deepest ego drives and begins to take form as resentment, overt or hidden, or a sense of deep-seated frustration which taints the ego reducing the child's natural sense of inner validity. A child needs to possess this sense of personal validity and should not be subdued or destroyed. It requires parents or teachers to point out very clearly that other people in the world also have their needs, their rights to their possessions, their desire for peace and pleasure. No one, not even a child or adult, has the right to upset another person in order to obtain their own satisfaction. If another youngster hits the child and makes him cry, it is only natural for the ego drive to want to fight back. He is programmed to defend himself against the other child. It calls for parents and teachers to point out that a payback, revenge and conflict, only escalates, bringing more pain to each child, and for this reason, payback is entirely pointless. Better to laugh and turn away. And rather than allow the irritation and hurt in the mind to continue, better still to take the problem to divine consciousness and prayer, and ask for the hurt to be removed from his consciousness, and seek a means of reconciliation. A child should also be taught to take time to understand that he and the other child are equally children born of the divine moment. When a child is spiritually receptive and can make this procedure of recognizing his spiritual kinship, with other children and all living things, and the rights of others equal with his own into a habit, he will have been given the greatest spiritual gift possible. In such a way is the ego drive weakened by the practical daily application of inspirational love while the central I-ness of the child remains strong and self-confident. The child should be taught the benefits of laughter which I will describe and explain in a later letter. Therefore, skilled and insightful teaching is absolutely necessary to steer the child into an appreciation of the rights of other people, equal with their own rights. This is the spiritual law which should dominate the home and the classroom, and any other law by which to judge circumstances is faulty and lacking in balance. 
the best teaching will rely not on the will of the teacher, the because I say so attitude, but on a systematic reference in every circumstance to brotherly love and the equal rights of others. At the same time, a child should not be indoctrinated into self-sacrifice, since this type of caring must be willing and born only of the individual's spiritual perceptions and goals. Self-sacrifice is born of spiritual enlightenment, of a higher road to follow, of denial of the little self to remove the ego barriers obstructing attunement with the universality of divine consciousness. True enlightened self-sacrifice brings a spiritual consciousness to the heights of joy. There is no sense of loss in any form. To better describe the reality of the soul and the ego, I want you to cup your hands together, fingertips touching fingertips, and wrists together, leaving a space between your cupped hands. Your hands represent the human consciousness shell of a person, the ego. The space correctly represents the soul, born of the father-mother consciousness, life, at the moment of your conception. While to human senses it appears to be nothingness, it is, in fact, an offshoot of the allness and wholeness of divine consciousness, out of which all created things have taken form. Your hands, with the space between, represent the I. Your left and right hands represent two potent forces of the magnetic ego drive. They represent forces of bonding rejection, but at the same time, quite rightly, they are the physical representation of the physical energies known to science as magnetism, bonding, and repulsion. Bend back your right hand from the other one and visualize that you use this right hand to get what you want out of life. It represents also what your human consciousness perceives as the grasping attitude to life. Give time to this exercise and fully realize your right hand represents the magnetic pull, the bonding, the attraction, the gravity evident in all of nature. It is the source of all wanting and desiring. It is the magnetic impulse which is always directed at getting what is necessary or greatly desired and pleasurable in life. This magnetic impulse is spiritually intended to be directed toward constructive purposes, gaining, holding, building, achieving. Were there no other people or living things in the world, the magnetic impulse could have full sway in a personality and no harm done. It is only when other people or living creatures or other people's persons and possessions have to be taken into account that the uncontrolled magnetic impulse to attract, draw, bond, hold, possess becomes a sickness of the personality if it is not equally balanced with the needs of all other living things. Return your hand to its original place, cupped with the left hand. Now pull back your left hand and visualize that this hand represents the magnetic impulse to repel, push away, slap, or defend yourself from any unauthorized encroachment on your property or possessions or any attack on your character, family, or work. This left hand represents the magnetic impulse of rejection, which is spiritually intended to ensure your privacy and save your life. It is a legitimate weapon when your physical or emotional survival is at stake, always providing you remember that your every action is an electromagnetic activity binding repulsion blueprint in consciousness, which rebounds and externalizes eventually in the form of a similar attack on the self. The unpleasantness may be criticism from your parent, teacher, employer, and the words of self-defense which spring to mind and jump out of your mouth are ego words wholly given to self-defense, expressing the magnetic drive of repulsion and rejection. As your ego words of attack flare up into angry speech, so is the ego of your critic similarly threatened, and it also rises up in him or her as words of self-defense against you. What may have started out as a necessary and adult action of pointing out some error and a better way to do 
is frequently immediately seen by a self-centered, sensitive ego as a personal attack. What should have been a moment of growth develops into a time of conflict, anger, possibly tears, ongoing resentment, and mutual hostility. In such swift, unexpected, unnecessary ways, conflict is generated in the mind, expressed in words, even actions, and perpetuated through resentment and hatred. Remember that every activity of the mind, the mental thought, and the emotional reactions of attraction and repulsion are all consciousness energies of creativity. These consciousness energies not only create the unpleasant rebound forms, but they develop the direction of the character and even affect relationships generally and the environment. And they reduce the life vitality of the body, leading directly to a sense of physical malaise, viral infection, or long-term disease. The higher way, when under attack of any kind, a way having only constructive repercussions, is to remember you can instantly call upon divine consciousness from which you will draw instant protection in any eventuality. But this is only possible if you can move beyond the magnetic ego drive of resistance in the perfect assurance that divine consciousness meets your every need. Now return your left hand to its original position with the right hand. Realize that throughout this exercise, the space between your hands has remained the space. It has not been involved in any of the activity of the hands, and so it is with your soul when your ego is busily at work, second by second, always and forever on the alert to fulfill your needs and defend you from any unpleasantness. The divine consciousness of your soul remains hidden, although it is always within you. When I was on earth, I spoke to the people about the kingdom of heaven. I said it was within you. So it is. It is your soul. It is the haven of equilibrium of the divine consciousness which gave you being as a future man or woman. I greatly long to be able to put into your minds a broad view of your source of being to enable you to perceive a little more clearly your beginnings from whence you have come. You must also understand at all times that when I speak a word of description of that which is truly unknowable, I am myself standing in the very highest infinitesimal frequencies of vibration, on the very edge of the great universal equilibrium, out of which all things have drawn their being and taken on their form. If I speak of a mountain, a picture will come to your mind, but you will not know the immensity of its structure the endurance of its rocks, its ravines and peaks and caverns, the snow which caps it in all seasons, the waterfalls cascading into pools when its glaciers melt. For you to gain a glimpse of the grandeur of the mountain, I would have to go into a detailed description of its every nook and cranny. Even after the most detailed verbal explanations, you would still have only imagined mental pictures to draw on. You would still not know the mountain. If I speak of a hurricane, I can bring to your mind trees bowing to the ground, bent by the tremendous winds, walls crumbling, rafters broken, bricks and roofs flying, windows shattered, cars overturned, great trees uprooted, but you will never know the force and the noise of that wind, the crash of falling masonry, or the terror it generates in people's hearts who have to endure it, until you have experienced it for yourself. So it is when I try to describe for you that which brought all creation into being. You can only guess, not know. It will only be after you have experienced all I have spoken about for yourself that you will begin to gain some idea of what I am trying to tell you. Therefore, let no one who reads my letters dispute with another or deny the truth of what I am teaching you, or refute my words. For I tell you truly that you cannot fully know what you have not experienced. It is only those who will follow me in acceptance and faith into daily meditation, the cleansing of consciousness, and impassioned prayer for enlightenment, who will eventually gain ever-deepening glimpses, then experiences, of what creation itself may access. 
divine consciousness.